Welcome to the Eduonix Cloud Course. In today's lecture, we're starting on cloud technology examples. And this is our first example where we look at infrastructure as a service and platform as a service on the Amazon AWS EC2 Elastic Compute Cloud Platform. You can find this document with the title I have highlighted here in the documentation folder for this topic. Now, let me just introduce this topic briefly. In this topic, we will go to the Amazon Web Services and we will look in particular at the service Elastic Cloud Compute, or EC2. And in the first instance, we will look at infrastructure as a service as it applies to the EC2 service. And then we will move on to platform as a service. The first thing we need to do to get going on Amazon Web Services and EC2 in particular is a free account and we need to sign up for that account now. The Amazon Web Services documentation is extensive and is constantly upgrading, so it's easy for a new user to be, one, overwhelmed, and two, not to find what you need. So we will try to point you to the URLs you need to get going on the service. And the first URL is the sign up URL, which we have here, and we will go there now. This is the sign up and introductory landing page URL for Amazon's EC2 service. EC2 is the acronym for Elastic Cloud Compute. For these services, they have a schema that is used to describe the different services that are available within the EC2 section of the Amazon Cloud. And let's just start working on that schema now. So over here where it says create a free account, you can see a section where it's describing an AWS free tier where it tells you that 750 hours of an operating system that is Linux or Windows. That's the free tier and it represents a really good value and a good way to get started in the cloud as a developer at the infrastructure as a service layer. The schema can be described in this word here, t2.micro, this is a schema expression for a particular instance inside the EC2 service. Now the instance represents a virtual machine that you can configure to be a virtual server. A t2.micro is a schema representation for the type of that machine. So a micro is a small machine. So you have larger machines, you have different machine options. Each option represents a set of resources, like a number of CPUs and amount of memory. So the free one is only a micro one, which means small, so you don't get a lot, but it doesn't cost you anything, and it's a very good thing to learn how to use in the first instance. Now you can find a lot of other information, and this page points you to a lot of other resources that are available within EC2. And it also points you to the pricing where you can look at the cost, so it goes from the free tier and then you can look at other options. Once you've signed up for Amazon Web Services and you've obtained your credentials, you can log in to Amazon Web Services and then you need to be able to find this console for most things. And you can find the screen by clicking on the orange cube in the top left. So wherever you are in the extensive Amazon Web Services documentation, by clicking on this orange cube, you will always return to this main page, which is a good portal entry point for all the services. And it shows all the Amazon Web Services. And these services are basically at the IAAS, or Infrastructure as a Service level, or PAAS, Platform as a Service level. I would say that these services relate to those levels in our cloud model. Now we will select EC2 because we're going to configure and set up a basic machine for the free tier service. So now I'm at the EC2 console and I'm ready to start creating a virtual machine on the Amazon Web Services Cloud EC2 platform. Now we'll go through the steps of creating a virtual machine on the Amazon AWS EC2 console. Now there are a few things that you need to provide, so we'll step through this fairly quickly. 
But if you try to do this by yourself and it doesn't work, you might need to come back later and review all the steps carefully. So the first thing that's crucial is we need to choose what is our region. So we choose a region that's closest to us. So I'm selecting EU Ireland because I'm making this video in European Union. However, if you are in the Asia Pacific region, you could choose Tokyo. If you are down south in Asia Pacific, you could use Australia. So you can choose which is the best region for you wherever you are in the world. It's important that you choose your region when you create your key pair because that's the next thing you need to do is to create a key pair and the key pairs correspond to regions. So a key pair that I create for the EU might not work in North America or the Asia Pacific. Having chosen my region, now I choose a key pair for that region. And I need to create a key pair, so I select Create Key Pair. I choose a key pair name and I go to Create. And now I have a key pair and I'm good to go. And I need to use this, I need to register my box with this key pair when I create my box. So summarizing, choose my region, create my key pair. Now I'm going to go back to my EC2 dashboard and I'm going to create an instance. So I have these steps that I need to step through for creating a virtual machine. So I select launch instance and now I can choose my operating system. Now you can see what I'm highlighting here. It says free tier eligible. I must choose an operating system that has free tier eligible. For this exercise, what I'm going to do is create a MySQL database online. The reason I'm going to create a MySQL database is because MySQL transcends languages. Whatever web application or whatever application you're going to be creating in the cloud, the chances are you will need a database. Now, I'm going to choose Ubuntu. A good choice could be Red Hat Linux. Here we see for free tier you can use Red Hat Linux. This is a good way to learn Red Hat Linux. The learning curve to set up a MySQL server on Red Hat Linux is just a little bit higher than setting up on your basic Debian box. We have two families of Linux. Red Hat Fedora is one basic family and then Debian Ubuntu is another basic family. So we'll choose the easiest operating system and the easiest useful service that we can install. So we're going to choose Ubuntu and we're going to set up MySQL. So we select the 64-bit Ubuntu. And you can see the screen flag here that says, okay, if we choose this one, it will be free tier. So we'll choose this one for free tier. And we can see we have these options here that I'm highlighting at the top. And if we go through the next, it will take us to these options. So if we go now to configure instance, we can see that we have some defaults and we can select defaults. So now step through to add storage. I'm adding 29 gigabytes because it says I can get up to 30 gigabytes. I'm just being a bit careful because I want to try and stay inside the free tier. So free tier includes up to 30 gigabytes. So 29 gigabytes is clearly safe. So I go to the next screen, which is tag instance. So you could just accept the defaults as in most cases. And in security group, we can also accept defaults. So finally, we review. And now we get this message, improve your instance's security. Your security group is open to the world. That means I haven't restricted the IPs that can access this box at the administration level. So when we open port 80 on the internet, people can log in on port 80 from anywhere on the internet. And this is for other ports like SSH. So it's open to anywhere and anyone. The box is protected by the security key pair. So I've created a security key pair so no one can log in as long as I've locked down the SSH access to the security key pair so I'm safe to ignore this warning for now. What I can do now is launch the instance. It's asking me, by default, to select an existing key pair. This is the key point. I needed to set up a key pair before I could actually launch the box, which is a good safety feature in Amazon. 
So it's selected my single key pair by default and I have to accept some terms and now I can launch the instance. When I log in with SSH, the security keys need to be set up correctly on the box to allow SSH access. So even though it can be accessed from anywhere in any IP, and let's say I have the correct SSH key, I won't be able to log in. Still, the security is not 100% it's good enough for this instance. So we'll just pause the video while the box launches. So now the box is up and running, and we can tell that by the running state display, which is green and running. Now some important attributes. We have the key name, we have the public IP used for many applications, and the security group is very important. We can identify these three key attributes, security group name, key name, and public IP. We can always find this in the instances. If we just go to the top level dashboard, it doesn't show our running instances. So over on the right here, we need to select instances to see the instances that are running. And if we want to do further actions on this instance, we must select it. So now it's deselected. And now, I've selected it. So before we do anything, we need to go down to its security group. So here on the left here, I'm selecting security group. And here is the security, and launch wizard one is a security group, so I select that. And down in this configuration down here, what I need to do is go to the inbound tag, and I see I have one open port port 22, it's for SSH access, so that needs to be open. Now for outbound, everything is open, so everything can go out, but coming in, as far as the security controls are concerned, I can only come in on port 22 with SSH. And this box is locked down with a security key by default. The access to the box is only open through port 22 with the SSH protocol, and you must have the actual public-private key pair. The private key on the server and the public key on the client and then you would be able to do SSH access for the terminal. And that's what we'll do now. Now we will configure and go through the steps to SSH into the box. Now we're going to create a terminal connection to our running Ubuntu instance in the Amazon cloud. To do that we will need to access our private key. We went through creating a key at the start of setting up the box. When you create a key pair, it automatically downloads the key for you, so it should be in the downloads, so your browser has downloaded it to your common download location. Now you have the private key. To use the private key on Linux is easy. For Windows, it's a bit harder. So what we'll do is we'll go carefully through the Windows steps as well as our private key. We need some extra software. We need what's known as PuTTY, which is SSH terminal, and a key software or a key transforming software called PuTTY Gen. And this is the download link for both of those softwares. And this is how they are displayed on the download link. So if we go here, you can see this is the download link in the documentation, and we want PuTTY, and we want PuTTY Gen. On this page, the first and the last. These are the two softwares that we need to download. We need to make sure that we can locate our private key. So let's have a look at what it looks like in my box. So here, this is on my box, my Windows box. I have putty gen, putty, and this is my private key. Notice it is a .pem. Once you've got all that set up in the box, and you just run the executables by double clicking on it. So this is putty, what putty looks like, and this is what putty gen looks like. So now we're going to go through the steps of transforming our key from the PEM key to the sort of key that PuTTY works with. We'll do that now. So now I'm going to use PuTTY Gen to transform my .PEM key to the format that PuTTY can use, which is this format here, SSH2RSA. And it's important that I don't use a paraphrase. So let's see how that works out. So this is PuTTY Gen, and I select key, and and I check it's on the correct format, SSH2 RSA, and I select load, and I navigate to where I know the key is on the file system. And by default, I don't see it because it's the wrong extension. I must select all files. There is my key, and I open. So 
it's imported it. So now I'm going to have to actually save it as a private key. And I get a warning, do you want to save without a paraphrase? And I say, yes, I don't want to save with a paraphrase. So I have to give it an actual file name, Eduonix, and it's going to be PPK. Save it in the correct PPK format as Eduonix. So now I save this. Now it's saved. Everything is good. I have a key in the right format that PuTTY can use. Now we're ready to connect with a PuTTY SSH client. Before we can do that, we must set up some configuration variables. First, we must figure out what our username is. Now, if we're using the Ubuntu Amazon machine image, then the username is Ubuntu. And if we have Red Hat or Linux, I've listed the usernames here. And this all comes from the Amazon documentation, but it can be a little hard to find for a new user. Then we also need the public DNS name, and we can find that from the running Amazon instance where we go to the public DNS. And it's a little bit hard to get at. If you double click on it, go Control C, you can right click it into your text editor. And then you can set up this connection variable just like I've set it up here for the running instance that we've created in this video. So this is my connection credentials if you like. So I copy that into PuTTY. So if I go back in PuTTY to my initial PuTTY screen, and here it says hostname or IP address, I put the string that I've created here into PuTTY into this text field here. And I must check that my port is 22 and that I am on connection type SSH. And here on the tree menu on the left, I go to SSH. I select auth and I select browse. And if everything is configured correctly, you'll see the key you created with PuTTYgen. So we downloaded the PEM key from Amazon and transformed it to a PPK key. We've created that key correctly and we see it. If we haven't done that step correctly, we won't see this key. So we open up the key, we click open, and now we're trying to connect. Now it's giving me a warning message because this is the first time. It's saying we're trying to connect to a secure connection. So I can just go, yes, it's authenticating with a public key. So I'm actually into the running Ubuntu configuration. Now I've successfully logged in with an SSH client called PuTTY into my running Ubuntu instance in the Amazon cloud. So let's just quickly set up a service. In this case, we'll set up a MySQL server. First, I must run this command to update the repositories in the box so it knows where to get everything to install MySQL. So I've previously run that command now, this next command won't work unless I run the first command. Unless I run sudo apt-get update first, this command will fail. So now I run this command, I say yes, and it's now downloading MySQL. This will take a little while, but we'll just let it run. So it wants the root user password, it will ask for confirmation. So now I've given it a root user, so now it's installing MySQL server. And one of the reasons we have chosen Ubuntu to set up as our first box is it's so easy to install software on Ubuntu. If I wanted to install MongoDB, it would have been just as easy, just a simple command which you run. But you must remember that when the box first boots up, it's a fresh Ubuntu instance, so you have to run the update command. So now I should be able to log into MySQL. And you can see I have MySQL. So that winds up our investigation, our demonstration of how you can use the Amazon EC2 service as infrastructure as a service, how you can create a virtual machine and set up an application. In this case, we chose MySQL. Now, we'll move on to looking at an equivalent exercise using Google Cloud Compute.